this one? Oh, it is hot. Okay, maybe we can um, get started. Great. Thank you all for uh, coming to, uh, uh, I guess this is the uh, second of our uh, annual uh, celebrations of, uh, uh, you know, uh, major uh, events and uh, um, uh, scientific uh, discoveries uh, within uh, the lab. Uh, uh, thank you all uh, very uh, much for coming. It should be uh, uh, a very fun day. Uh, I'll just remind uh, everybody that uh, since this is, um, in some sense, filling in for uh, you know the annual retreat that we used to have, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, opportunity to uh, listen uh, to the uh, talks we have today, um, please also take the opportunity to uh, get to know uh, each other, uh, go to the posters, talk to folks not only in your own group but outside. You know, this is one of the very few opportunities that we have to all be together. Uh, I know when I've uh, spoken to uh, the students in the lab, uh, they say, you know, we need more opportunities to be together. So uh, I'm sure they're right about that, but this is one of them. So make sure that you take advantage of it. Um, and uh, I think Stacy and Bill have found a fantastic venue for us. This is a really uh, cool and nice place. Uh, and so uh, let's take advantage of the space and the opportunity. Uh, so. Um, I was uh, trying to think of uh, how to get this uh, started, and I was uh, reminded of a story uh, that our colleague uh, uh, Van Wadeen once told me. And I don't know entirely uh, whether he uh, uh, came to this uh, you know, from personal experience, but uh, uh, he did tell the story once of uh, three travelers uh, who were uh, going uh, uh, into, uh, uh, you know, uh, deep into the uh, jungles of uh, South America. Uh, when uh, they were, uh, you know, surprised by a, uh, you know, large group of uh, rather hostile-looking uh, natives uh, and uh, carried off to their village. Um, they went to the village, uh, you know, one of them uh, spoke a little bit of the, uh, you know, native, uh, you know, language, so there was some communication. They were surrounded uh, by the villagers who seemed uh, none too happy to have them there. Uh, and the chief of the village came up uh, to these uh, uh, three folks, uh, uh, and uh, came up to the first one and said, well, you know, you really don't belong here. This is not your place. Uh, so I'm going to give you a choice, uh, uh, death or mamba. So the first guy said, well, you know, I have, uh, uh, you know, a family at home. Uh, you know, uh, I have responsibilities. I can't afford to die. Uh, I don't know what mamba is, but I choose mamba. So, you know, then started, you know, an hour-long, you know, orgy and celebration of all sorts of horrible and degrading uh, things to this person, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Roy Moore and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, the rest of the uh, crew and the news today had nothing, uh, you know, uh, on this guy, uh, you know, what they did to him, just horrible, degrading, you know, things. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, eventually that was over and, uh, you know, uh, after this, you know, horribly humiliating experience, uh, you know, off he went. So then they uh, go to the second guy, and the chief, of course, comes up to him and says, well, death or mamba? He says, mamba, ish, but, uh, you know, I just have too much to live for. Uh, I can't afford, uh, you know, uh, to die now. I'll choose mamba. And again, you know, another hour's worth of, uh, you know, the worst possible degrading, humiliating, uh, you know, experiences to this person. Finally, they came up uh, to the third visitor, and again, the chief came up, and he said, death? or Mamba, and he said, I, I just can't allow myself to be degraded in that way. You know, this is just completely unacceptable. Uh, you know, I choose, uh, uh, you know, I choose death. And the chief said, okay, death, but first a little Mamba. <laughs> okay, so now you might wonder, uh, you know, why I'm telling that particular story. So um, it was maybe about, um, uh, oh, you know, five or six years ago that we started a tradition in the center uh, that when, uh, you know, our faculty reached uh, the rank of uh, full professor, 
we would have a party, a celebration uh, around that event. And that's a major event uh, in our uh, life. And, uh, uh, you know, when that happened, I remember, I think Greg, uh, you know, uh, actually there was a party for me, Greg Sorensen, uh, Larry Wald, uh, you know, uh, Umar, uh, Anna Moore. You know, this is a, a kind of a big event in the life of the lab. And for those of you, you know, just kind of starting out, who you know, might think that uh, you know, full professorship is an unobtainable goal, uh, it's nice to see no, it's very obtainable, and here are you know, the exemplars of that and their outstanding work. When Bruce uh, you know, uh, received his full professorship, however, and we said we were gonna have a party, he said, no, that would just be too embarrassing and humiliating an experience. <laughs> I don't really wanna be the center of attention that way and expose myself to that. Uh, you know, uh, no, but you know, I could imagine having a seminar, you know, around the kind of work we did, and that would be, you know, a, that would be a nice way to celebrate it. <laughs> and so, uh, here we are today. It, was, it took us a little while. We're having a wonderful celebration of this amazing uh, a piece of software and the uh, um, result that it's had uh, on the community. Uh, but first, a little mamba. <laughs> Because indeed, you know, while we're here to celebrate the software, the software didn't write itself. And while there were, of course, antecedents to this amazing piece of software, um, uh, it really was driven, uh, not only its creation, uh, but its uh, extension and its application uh, by uh, one uh, gentleman, uh, Bruce Fischel. And uh, we are not only here to celebrate uh, the software, but we're also here to celebrate his achievements in making this uh, all uh, happen today. Uh, feeling uh, sufficiently uh, humiliated at this point? Actually, I'm looking forward to getting the microphone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was complaining bitterly that he had to do the introductions instead of me, but now he's like anxious. So, um, uh, I think it's uh, um, uh, easy for everybody who has had the opportunity uh, to use this tool, uh, and that's of course, not only many people in this room, but literally thousands and thousands of people around the world to know the role that Bruce has played. Um, you know, while you know, many people uh, uh, around the world and even people in our own lab were scrambling to try to you know, license things and uh, profit uh, from their inventions, you know, Free Surfer is uh, free, right? That's, uh, it's embedded in the name that the, the whole um, you know, gestalt of, of Bruce's intent for this, that this was meant to be shared with the community, open source, uh, and used to advance uh, science. And that really came from his own generosity and spirit, and, you know, we not only see it in the name, but we also see it in the time that he spent, the endless uh, efforts he's put into education with the software. He and, of course, uh, his uh, colleagues like uh, Doug and Anastasia and many others you know, perform uh, or t arrange for courses all around the world, again, with the notion of propagating these tools uh, to uh, our scientific community. And of course, uh, the reason so many people come to those courses is that these tools have now become the definitive way that neuroscientists and clinical scientists, and uh, based on Bruce's latest work that you'll hear about, clinicians, you know, are using this tool to understand the brain understand brain development, understand diseases everywhere from, you know, childhood diseases, uh, indeed even in utero diseases, all the way through to uh, uh, the conditions that afflict us as we, uh, uh, you know, approach uh, end of life. Um, uh, a, re a remarkable range of applications, all of which have flowed from the creativity uh, and energy and dedication to sharing uh, that uh, Bruce has brought to, uh, to this activity. So uh, I uh, very much want to uh, welcome you all to this celebration. It is a celebration of Free Surfer, but I think before uh, we start uh, celebrating a piece of software, let's celebrate the man that uh, brought this software to life and has given it life uh, to, uh, uh, to the world. So uh, Bruce, uh, congratulations on your professorship. And, uh, Thank you for uh, uh, bringing such a great day for us today. Come on up. No, no, it's the um, it Donna's thing. Oh, it's done. All right. Okay, so that was Bruce's side of the story. 
Uh, my memory of it is slightly different. So I know that the, sorry. So I know that he did want me to have a celebration uh, when I finally got the full professorship, however many years it was ago. Uh, my strategy was to run out the clock with Stacy. She kept asking me, what should we do, when should we do it? And I kept not answering her emails or saying, let me think about it. Uh, but when Bruce, yeah, so, so it wasn't a viable strategy, I guess. Uh, when Bruce and Bill suggested doing this symposium, my reaction was, absolutely not. That's a terrible idea. It's going to be extremely dull. But you know, when I thought about it for a little while, I realized that it was a terrible idea, and we really should not do it. <laughs> because I thought that people would not be interested in kind of the history uh, of, of what happened and kind of the technical problems that we solved. I will say that it is lovely to see people, that it is lovely to see, you know, Wim is here, and I, even Nusheen and I are in the same hospital, but we rarely see each other. You know, even Polina, who's across the river, I never see. It's nice to see old friends. Um, so I am going to kind of try and go through a little bit of the history. I'm sorry if this is dull, um, but there were kind of some technical developments that were required uh, and kind of the challenges that we faced at the time and the things that we did in order to, to get to where we are today. And so this, so this is kind of an overview of what FreeSurfer is today, right? We can stick in an MRI, we can get out a bunch of surfaces, we can do segmentations, we can do group maps and spherical averaging and such. And as Bruce says, it's become pretty popular. So this is an example of, this is a, a quantification of the number of licenses from 2000. And so at the moment, there are almost you know, 33,000 licenses distributed. So it really has had an impact. I think that a lot of us take a lot of heart in that. You know, um, many of us who develop software do it because we want to have an impact. We want to help human health. We want to understand the brain. And so the, the ability to write algorithms is fun, uh, but the ability to help people do interesting science, interesting clinical work with it is really, at the end of the day, what makes it so worthwhile for us. So what people may not know is that FreeSurfer actually began life um, as an EEG and MEG analysis tool. So this is uh, this gave rise to these pair of papers. Uh, so if you can model the cortical surface, you can actually linearize the EEG-MEG inverse problem. So you have a, a measurement of a bunch of sources outside the head, uh, sorry, a bunch of sensors outside the head, and you want to infer the distribution of currents in the brain that gave rise to those measured signals. If you have cortical surface models, you can linearize the inverse problem and make these amazing spatiotemporal maps of brain activity over time. And this gave rise to this pair of papers um, that Anders, this was uh, basically Anders' dissertation, I think, um, published in 94. Um, and then here's a second one that was part of, I think, Arthur's dissertation as well in 2000. So, you know, highly cited papers. But this is really where it all began. And this is when I came to MGH, FreeSurfer was mainly a tool for EG and MEG analysis and was just beginning to be used for retinotopic analysis. You know, so Nusheen and Roger and uh, Janine Mandola and people were starting to use these tools in order to get at the retinotopic structure of early human vision. So at this time, there were unsolved technical problems that in retrospect, you know, we kind of think, it was a piece of cake, but one of them was the inability to model the cortical surface. So when we think of the cortical surface, we're talking about the peel surface, which is you know, the interface between the gray matter and the CSF. But there are many places in the brain, so it's, it doesn't project terribly well, but there are many places like this and this where you can't see the peel surface. Right? There's kind of a continuum of gray matter across this apparent sulcus. Right? We know that there's a sulcus here. We know that the peel surface must run through here, but you can't resolve it in the images. You don't see any image-based markers that tell us where the peel surface are. And so around 1996, people were running around human brain mapping saying, how do we find the peel surface? You know, we can't model it directly. We can model it down here where we can see the CSF, but out here we can't. And in retrospect, you know, this kind of seems like this simple insight, and I'll, I'll point out this was Anders and Marty's and not mine, um, but what we did, instead of directly modeling the peel surface, if we go back to this slide, whoops, sorry. If we go back to this slide, we can infer that there must be peel surface here because there's white matter here. And so instead of directly modeling the peel surface, what we did is we built a model of the boundary between the gray and the white, which we could see everywhere. And then this tells us that there must be peel surface out here. We can deform the surface outward in order to find that surface. So this gave rise to this pair of papers, um, the Recon 1 and Recon 2 papers, um, which are pretty highly cited these days. This paper in particular, was subject to my favorite review of all time. Um, so I'm paraphrasing here, but this is about what the review said. Uh, 
In the method section alone, scholarship is lacking, the notation is incorrect and misleading, and even a basic understanding of elementary topology is lacking. <laughs> that said, this is by far the strongest section of the paper. <laughs> do you remember this review? So in the end, so I actually do know who it was, and I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you later, Marty, who it was. Um, so this is an example of a review that was uh, self-annihilating. It was so vitriolic that the editor actually ditched it and got a, another reviewer. Uh, but we actually encountered this reviewer again later in life, which is another story. <laughs> so the, surface -based, the challenge of the surface-based modeling is that at the time was that you kind of had this choice of either imposing topology, making sure the surface is topologically correct, or making sure it was geometrically accurate. There were no <laughs> techniques that existed then that allowed you to do both. And there was a trade-off between them. Right? So we would like a topologically correct model. That is, it doesn't have any handles across the banks of a sulcus or a hole in the, in the banks. Um, so that the distances along the surface are, are, aren't dramatically distorted. And I'll give you an example of what this means in a minute. Um, and that it's also possible to establish point-to-point -point registration across subjects at every point. So this requires that the surfaces be topologically correct. If the surfaces are topologically different, then you can't establish a point-to-point -point correspondence at every point in the brain. So the only technique at the time that guaranteed topology was shrink wrapping, where you take a surface that has the right topology, a sphere, and you write down some energy functional that drives it to sit at the surface that you want, you know, either the gray-white surface or the, or the peel surface. Uh, the problem is that shrink wrapping a highly folded surface like that is hard and maybe impossible. I've never seen a successful example of it. So this is what a topological error looks like. So this is a handle, this is a hole. And they're small, so you, you can, if you missegment even a single voxel, you can cause the topology to be incorrect. And the reason it's important is that it kills the metric properties of the surface. So this point and this point should be five, six centimeters apart, right? To get from here to here, you should have to go all the way to the bottom of the sulcus and all the way back up. But this one voxel mislabeling caused them to be two millimeters apart. And so you can imagine if you were doing surface-based smoothing, it would happily smooth these functionally distinct regions into each other. So shrink wrapping is the process of taking this type of surface that has the right topology, this one's a circle, but in 3D it would be a sphere, and driving it right down some energy function that says I want to minimize, say, the distance between every point here and every point there. Right? And the reason that that's hard and maybe not possible is that the brain looks like this. There are all these deep areas with these narrow openings. And so to get this surface, you know, enough of this surface area kind of to stuff it through this little opening, once you get to this point, you have to drive this surface away from this surface in order to find this surface down here. And so the energy functionals are generally highly non-convex, right? You get a bunch of surface here, and then you're going to push it up away from all the cortical surface that it wants to sit next to. Uh, so usually that means the energy increases. And so no one had solved this problem at the time. We couldn't generate topologically correct models of the cortex that we wanted to. So this is kind of a, a schematic of what shrink wrapping looks like. We're going to take this big sphere out here, and we're going to try and drive it down to sit at, say, the, the peel surface, which is this red border here. Right? And again, this kind of stuff is what's trouble. And so people were doing this. There were shrink wrapping models, but they had kind of gently rolling valleys for, for sulci. They didn't get into the depths of the sulci. And so they missed you know, 50 or 60% of the brain. They were kind of useless for any type of analysis. Uh, and so, actually, I vividly remember the day that we, that Anders and I kind of figured out the solution to this. We were, uh, you know, Anders leads a very, um, what's the word, uh, rich lifestyle. <laughs> so we were, so we were, he had like some penthouse apartment and we were on the roof one day and we were, and we were kind of trying to solve this problem. And what we realized is that this is hard. Taking a smooth surface and turning it into a folded surface is very difficult. You know, you can kind of think of it as inverse diffusion. It's an ill-posed problem in many ways. Um, but this is easy. Taking a folded surface and smoothing it to make this type of smooth surface is actually pretty easy. And so this is the way we do topology correction. Because if we can take the surface and drive it out to the surface of the sphere where every point here maps to exactly one point there, we're done. This is actually the definition of topological equivalence. Um, but to the extent that we can't do that, the two points sit at the same point on the sphere, that's a localization of a topological defect. And so what this means is that we can find these few points where the topology is incorrect and let, let just fix those and let the rest of the surface be correct. So let me just go back because I think this kind of gives you a good idea. So you can imagine that if we were taking the surface and driving it out to a sphere, this point here will have to sit 
at the same point at some point down at the bottom of the sur at surface. They'll kind of all inflate out and they'll sit on top of each other and we'll know that there's a defect here. Okay? So that's in fact how the topology correction works. Uh, we do segmentation where we don't care about topology more or less. We, we try and make the surface as accurate as possible. Uh, and then we find the regions where we can't find a single valued mapping to the sphere or a single valued invertible mapping to the sphere. We localize just those and then we correct just those. So the green is the original surface and the red is the corrected surface. And so at the end of the day, you get this topologically correct surface. You start with these handles, but you fix it so it's now topologically correct, but also geometrically accurate and sitting at the right interface. And this allowed us to do surface-based registration. So we could take you know, cortical surface models, model their geometry on the sphere, build statistics across subjects, and then build invertible warps from any one subject back out to any other subject. So this gave rise to another pair of papers. Um, this was the intersubject averaging paper um, that Roger was also part of, uh, and then the topology correction paper, which I think is probably my favorite title. Manifold surgery is just a cool title. And then finally, um, you know, for years we would do the surface-based stuff and people would say, well, what about the caudate? Can I do surface-based analysis of the caudate? And we'd be like, well, you know, the caudate's kind of a ball of gray matter. You, you don't want to do surface-based analysis of it. And so we, we got access to a bunch of manually labeled data like this and wrote these two papers on how we can take manually labeled data uh, and build segmentation tools that label every voxel in the brain automatically with about the same level of accuracy that a manual reader would do. Okay? And that resulted in this pair of papers. This was kind of the the original segmentation paper, and in this one we added a nonlinear warp and kind of some stuff about how to deal with um, um, cortical uh, sequences that are different. So if you have a flash scan and your TR is 20 and you change it to 25, how can the segmentation be adaptive to that? Um, okay, so that's all for the technical stuff. <laughs> so now I wanted to talk a little bit about how we came up with the name Free Surfer, which we were kind of chatting about just a minute ago. Um, and you know, things could have been a lot worse. Um, so at the time, Anders uh, was a big fan of these two gentlemen. Uh, this one in particular, his name is Beavis. Uh, so Anders had this brilliant idea. He wanted the name for Christopher Beavis. So he thought this was great. You know, it was going to be brain visualization, but you know, in secret, we would know that it was actually you know, Beavis and Beavis and Butthead. So uh, Marty. So if you don't know Marty. Um, let me digress for a second. Uh, Please don't. It's too late for that, Marty. You shouldn't have bought a ticket. Uh, Marty knows pretty much everything about everything. But, and this is great if, like, you know, it's kind of a relevant topic. But sometimes he knows a lot about stuff that is not all that relevant and that pretty much no one else in the world knows about. So Marty's idea, I guess Arthur's idea did not go far. Uh, Marty's idea was to name it D. And we were like, D, that's a weird name. Why would you name it D, Marty? Uh, but Marty's was naming a D because the C programming language, which I didn't know at the time, uh, is evidently named after B, which was an obscure and failed language in the 1960s from Bell Labs. <laughs> so if we named it D, we were showing that it was one better than C. <laughs> yeah, so this uh, didn't get a whole lot of play either. Uh, so I wanted to call it Exorbitant Surfer and charge for it, but we ended up distributing it freely instead. Okay, so, so a lot of people have pointed out to me that I came to MGH at a fortunate time for me. You know, I was someone who had worked in industry for seven years before going back to grad school. I'd been a software engineer. Um, the things, you know, that I took pleasure in were kind of programming, hacking code. Um, and it's true, you know, I came to MGH at a time when there was a bunch of code and a bunch of algorithmic problems that needed to be solved. Um, and it was, you know, an amazing time to, to be there. I mean, Anders, I don't know if, if most people have met Anders. Anders is, okay, Anders may be the smartest human being on the planet. He is an astonishingly smart person. I, I watched him transition from being, you know, a world-class algorithm developer to being a world-class MR physicist just by, like, reading some papers and figuring some stuff out. Uh, he's just that smart. Um, and as I said, Marty knows pretty much everything about everything. So if you have any questions about anything in life, you know, how to talk to your mother or something, just at the break, find Marty and ask him what the answer is. Uh, but the code was not maybe the best code ever. So I wanted to kind of poke at a couple of corners of the free server code and show you kind of what it was like. So this code, I think, was Marty's, I believe. 
um, you know, which is all perfectly reasonable, a bunch of, of uh, functions that allow you to apply a linear transform to the brain. You know, there are even like parameters to them and function declarations and stuff. But looking through the code, I came across these, but I found that Marty had another set of functions for when he was actually serious. <laughs> You know, so these, like, this was okay for us, you know, for, like, the postdocs and the grad students, we could use these, but, you know, when Marty was putting together his nature paper, this was, <laughs> these were the functions that he wanted to use. Anders' code was a little bit different, so I, Anders hated to type, uh, and so Anders loved single-digit variable names, single-character variable names. This is actually, I couldn't dig up the original code. Marty says he has it, I should find that. So this code has actually been modified by me to kind of have structures and things in it. Um, but you can always tell Anders' code because it's full of I's and J's and J1's and J2's and K's and K1's and K2's. And this, I think, was probably the most famous code at the time uh, because it, it's the code that um, led to brain inflation. So this was kind of everyone's favorite movie, which I'll play, hopefully. Yeah, it's a little slow on here. So the breathing brain, which everyone always loved, which is kind of mesmerizing. Uh, so I'm getting to that. But one of the interesting things about the free server code base is that it's got lots of hidden variables and flags them that make you wonder what they do. And so if we look at this code and we focus on a little bit of it, this was like great code for a po postdoc. Right? So here is a measure of stress, a prescription for what to do if stress exceeds some threshold, and a maximum threshold that you could specify, right? So it was pretty interesting looking at this, you know, what does explode flag do? It was zero in the code, um, but we can set it to one and see what it does. <laughs> uh, so Andrew Hoops, who's an engineer here, to help me compile a set of uh, contributors to FreeSurfer, and it's an astonishingly long list. I mean, it really, I, I'm sure that I've left some people out, so I tried to put um, people in here, oh, hopefully Gio, here's Gene, so that, so I added some people to the list who didn't actually contribute code, but, you know, contributed critical things to FreeSurfer, people like Gene, who's done manual labeling. Um, I would add a bunch of other people to the list as well. Um, uh, certainly, Bruce Rosen has been hugely supportive of the entire endeavor my entire time at, at, at MGH and has been a critical mentor in many ways. Uh, Jack Beliveau, who we all miss, was a giant part of this in the beginning. You know, Jack was very interested in the EG and MEG inverse problem uh, and was Arthur Liu's um, uh, PhD advisor. And are you going to tell any stories, Arthur? <laughs> so I think, I think the first day Arthur met Jack, he said, uh, pack your bags, we're going to Colorado skiing. <laughs> And for those of you who know Jack, Jack was like that. He, uh, he had a big heart. Um, I would also add to this list Didi Coria, who I miss a lot, who a lot of us who knew Didi miss a lot. Um, she, was, you know, she was not a scientist, but she was a giant help to everyone who knew her. Uh, anyway, so I, I wanted to end on this. So the other thing that Andrew put together for me was a history of the code base. And so this is going to be a movie that shows uh, every circle will be a file. Uh, every kind of sphere is a directory, and so this is a history, so you can't see this, this, this is a time stamp up here, it's 1996 is when it starts. So it's from the revision history of the code, and it shows the generation of the code. Here, I'll play it, I'll probably play it twice just so you can get an idea. So this is me here, creating files like crazy. I think, yeah, I think here's Doug, maybe, creating all the, uh, yeah, this is Doug there, creating all the functional analysis stuff. Um, I can't even read it. So you'll see Anastasia comes in, I think she creates Tracula down in here somewhere. And then Rupang is, has Freeview somewhere in here. You'll see Thomas Witzel kind of wandering around causing trouble. <laughs> So each one of these is kind of an application suite, you know, so this might be FS fast, and, and these are all the kind of binaries that hang off of it. So we're at 2012, I think.
Yeah, so 2017. So here's the end of it. Anyway, so this is where we are today. So it is, it is a giant endeavor. It's over a million lines of software. Um, Doug has recently gotten funding to kind of bring some rationality to it, which is a giant task in its own right. Um, he's, been, he's been asking me questions about code I wrote 15 years ago, saying, what does this do? And I'm like, oh my god, I have no idea. Um, but it, it, it should lead to a more stable, more robust piece of software. Anyway, this is all I have. I'm happy to chat about anything if people have questions about stuff. Okay, thank you.